Thank you for visiting the MFS Trade School in Orlando, Florida. We teach five unique courses online and some we do hands-on. But today I wanna to talk to you about one of our latest courses that started when COVID-19 hit. And that is a virus disinfection online course that we teach. It's a six hour course. And if you ever wanted to open your own business in virus disinfection, you need to take this course. There are some other courses out there, but none of them are as comprehensive as our course. We not only teach you the CDC and EPA guidelines of how to disinfect safely, but also we teach you what kind of chemicals to use, what kind of equipment you need to deploy those chemicals. Many people don't understand that when you're doing virus disinfection, especially when it comes to SARS-CoV-2, there are specific ways that the EPA and the CDC have allowed for you to be able to clean and disinfect those types of pathogens. It can't be done by just picking up a chemical and not knowing when to use that chemical. If you're in a residential home, if you're in a church that has a lot of wood, if you're in a daycare where children play, you have to know what type of chemicals to use. If you're doing a restaurant, there's chemicals that you can't use in a restaurant because if there, there may not be food contact safe. So we teach you all these things, but beyond that, we teach you marketing, we teach you estimating, we teach you where to find the big projects, not just the small residential and commercial jobs from businesses, but also schools and municipalities and townships that put out bids, virus disinfecting bids that are 50,000, 100,000, $200,000, three year contracts, okay, that we will teach you how to bid on. No one's gonna teach you that. We are the only school in the country that will teach you that. Why? Because we've mastered it. We've been doing it since 2013 with some of our other trade courses that we teach here, both hands-on and online. We have a bonding agency that I can actually help you get bonded so you can bid on these school contracts, the municipal contracts for virus disinfection, and we're here to help you beyond that. So let's say you finish the course Six to 12 months later, you have a question, you're putting together a bid, you're stuck, you don't have the answers. We're here to help you. Call us up, we'll give you a free consultation. Once you're a student of our school, your family, we will help you with everything you need. We have every type of chemical. We have every type of equipment. We make sure that we sell them at the right price for our students so you can be profitable. I welcome you to check us out Go to our vet's website, www.mfstradeschool.com, or give us a call at area code 407-732-4625. Again, 407-732-4625, and ask for a free consultation. We will be happy to help you get into a very lucrative business. There's tremendous amount of money that I see coming out from municipalities and, and government entities right now that are three to five year contracts. You need to be bidding on these projects. They're anywhere from $50,000, $100,000, dollar contracts, and you need to be bidding on them right now. And we can help you get into this lucrative industry. We look forward to seeing you as our student. Welcome to the MFS Virus Disinfection course. I'm Pauline and I will be your guide. MFS created this course to help you create a lucrative business by offering the most effective and efficient system for virus disinfection. We will be going over PPE, various tools, various types of disinfectants, and help you create your own set of standard operating procedures. In order to aid in your studying, there will be a sample test question at the end of each section. Most of these questions will be on the test, so please pay close attention. After the course, you will take a short 25 question exam, and then you're well on your way to becoming a certified virus disinfection technician. With all our courses, we encourage you to call and ask us questions if you ever need guidance. As always, at the MFS Trade School, your success is our success. So let's get started. 1.1, Industry Outlook. Is the disinfection field the new normal? 
Some think the disinfection industry might be a limited time business opportunity and will only last as long as the COVID-19 virus. Will anyone really even be thinking about this industry in two years? Based on the speculation and articles we've read, a higher rate of pathogen awareness will be the new normal for many years to come. Once fears and paranoias infiltrate the public's minds, it's very hard to get rid of them. People suggest that shaking hands, hugging, and similar person-to-person -person contact will be drastically reduced from now on. We've recently seen that more and more people are rethinking their long crowded commutes on subways and buses as more and more businesses are figuring out ways to allow more of their workforce to work remotely. Another factor is the expectation of a virus boomerang effect in the coming months after the initial outbreak. These factors all point to the necessity of a pathogen disinfection service industry for many years to come. 1.2, what is a target market? During epidemics or pandemics, the market for virus disinfection expands to every business, even the residential sector. There are certain businesses that are better candidates for virus disinfections than others all year round, regardless of the existence of outbreaks. Gyms, although popular, are especially subject to MRSA, ringworm, and other pathogens due to the sweaty, moist environments around their equipment. This is a good example of a business with a clear need of a monthly service contract for virus disinfection. Restaurants might be reopening, but convincing large numbers of fearful restaurant customers to return back to their initial levels of dining out is quite another thing. Daycare centers and schools are another industry that are especially subject to the necessity of higher levels of cleanliness. Daycare centers are trying to convince already nervous parents that their facilities are safe and their children won't be coming home sick all the time and spreading it to the rest of the family members. In addition to these, there are senior care centers, locker rooms, air travel, cruise ships, car rental companies, hotels, and many other industries. All this points to the virus disinfection service industry having a consistently high demand in the future. So for a study guide question for 1.2, choose the option that best describes our target market. Really, it's all of the above and many more than what's listed there. Let's talk about the coronavirus. 2.1, where does the name come from? Coronavirus is the name of the virus and COVID-19 is the name of the disease. In COVID-19, the CO stands for Corona, the VI for virus, and D for disease. Formerly, this disease was referred to as the 2019 novel coronavirus or 2019 NCOV-2 and several others. The bottom line is there are many types of human coronaviruses, including some that commonly cause mild upper respiratory tract illnesses. So they range from very mild to very severe. What is the history of the coronavirus? So novel or new coronavirus was first identified in the city of Wuhan in China's Yubei province in December of 2019. On February 11th of 2020, the World Health Organization, the WHO, renamed the disease caused by the virus as COVID-19. So it's a new disease. It has been around in recent years in different forms, such as what's called SARS, the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, and that came around in 2002 and, and lasted around eight months or so till 2003. COVID-19 is called novel, which means new, because it has not previously been seen in humans. So comparisons between the virus that causes COVID-19 and the one that caused the outbreak of SARS in 2003, they're related to each other genetically, but the diseases they cause were quite different. SARS was less infectious than COVID-19. There have been no outbreaks of SARS anywhere in the world since 2003. And when it was active, SARS totaled 8,273 cases and 775 deaths in 35, 37 countries from November 2002, and it ended in July of 2003. As of May 2020, COVID-19 numbered 5 million confirmed cases and 300,000 deaths in many more countries. So as you can see, COVID-19 is far more deadly. Another thing I want to point out here is I want to define pathogen um, because you're going to be hearing it a lot throughout this course and I want you to understand it, it it's just a more um, umbrella term for any bacteria, virus, or any microorganism that causes disease because now the 
you know, the focus might be COVID-19, but in the future, there's going to be different, uh, you know, different versions of COVID-19 and, and different outbreaks. So just know that a pathogen is really the, the umbrella term for any bacteria, virus, or microorganism that causes disease. 3.1. What is a chain of infection? The chain of infection is a series of events that causes a person to become infected. So according to the CDC, there are six main events that contribute to the chain of infection. Number one, there needs to be a presence of an infectious agent, in this case, COVID-19. Two is the reservoir, which is really the host that the pathogen needs a host to live in and multiply in. Three is the portal of exit, which is the path that the virus takes of leaving the host out through the respiratory tract in the form of a cough or a sneeze or whatever it is. Four is the mode of transmission. The pathogen is traveling to the new host. So how are they getting there? Either contact, droplet on a surface, airborne, which we discussed earlier. Number five is the portal of entry. So this is the way that the pathogen enters a new host, usually through inhalation and mucous membranes. And six is the susceptible host. The person may or may not have immunity, and that is the, the person that the virus is now in. So immunity can be acquired either naturally, as in usual, like young, healthy people, or artificially acquired through vaccination. So there's two ways to acquire immunity there. In 3.2, let's talk about breaking the chain of infection. So in the previous section, we discussed what the chain of infection usually looks like, how it travels. And now we're gonna look at at what point to break the chain. So MFS protocol teaches us to break this chain of infection at the transmission point. Hi, this is Chris from the MFS Trade School. And today we're gonna to show you how to disinfect an actual restaurant here in Sanford, Florida. So you guys can learn how to do this as well. So I wanna go over it things, the tools, the equipment, the different um, uh, PPE, personal protective equipment that you need to have to be able to do this job. And of course, you'll read about everything in our training manual as well. But um, this is what we consider our safe zone. Okay, so as you can see, we're standing outside, it's 80 degrees. This is our safe zone. Here is the area that we're going to put on our PPE, personal protection equipment. You're going to hear me say that word often. And uh, we're going to go over all the tools and equipment. We're going to mix our chemical, our disinfected EPA approved chemical. We're going to talk about that as well throughout the training. But I just want to visually just show you everything. And then we're going to proceed inside the restaurant, which is the transition zone in the, in the hallway area after we're all suited up with our correct protective equipment. And then we're going to go into the operations area. So. Everything is classified uh, into three zones, okay? So, I wanna show you our sprayer. This is a battery-operated sprayer, the X-Pro. It's made here in the USA. It's a great machine. You charge it up and you get eight hours of running time. Uh, below it, we use this little dolly here, and below it is the five-gallon container that we're gonna mix our SantaQuat product with and um, we're going to show you how to mix that as well to make a, a strong disinfectant to kill anything from um, germs, uh, bacteria, viruses, uh, MRSA, E. coli, salmonella, the coronavirus, everything that the label says that it can do, if you follow its instructions, it's going to do what it says. So it's not just the disinfectant, but it's also the person doing the actual disinfecting, they have to comply with the correct sprayer they have to comply with the correct uh, dwell time which is the time that it takes to kill the the viruses and the germs so if one of those things are off guess what you're not going to be disinfecting so everything has to gel perfectly to be able to get a real accurate and good disinfection so you're going to see here that we brought uh, our pump sprayer because who knows maybe our machine will go down so you don't want to have to sacrifice leaving a job and not finishing and not getting paid. So you want to have a professional sprayer. This is a two and a half gallon. It has a uh, gauge here that you can see how much pressure you're pumping. 3.4. What is a high touch surface? 
High touch surfaces are surfaces that are handled frequently throughout the day and by numerous people. So for your purposes, these are the areas when you're disinfecting that you're going to be focusing on. These areas include doorknobs, light switches, phones, sinks, faucets, um, armchairs, refrigerator handles, or anything like that. They become contaminated by direct contact with hands or through indirect contact with other contaminated objects, such as maybe, you know, a, an inadequately cleaned rag or sponge or, or hands that aren't washed properly. Uh, and don't forget that pathogens can stay on these surfaces for days if they're not properly removed. So for example, hepatitis A and rotavirus can survive up to one month on a hard, non-porous surface, while noroviruses can survive up to 42 days on the same type of surface. With SARS and CoV-2, high-touch surfaces have been shown to play a role in the collection of the virus both directly, contaminated hands to the surface, and indirectly, contamination from touching the surface, and then subsequently hand to T-zone of eyes, nose, and mouth. So the study guide question in this section is what is a high touch surface? You're going to be focusing on these when you're disinfecting. So make sure to always think what is more likely in this room that I need to disinfect? What is more likely to be touched? I mean, if you're in a daycare center, it, it's going to be even the toys. It's, it's going to be even the floors because, you know, children crawling around on floors and that kind of thing. So for the average office space, it would be light switches, handrails, you know, doorknobs, computers, phones, all that kind of stuff. If you're in a daycare center, it's going to include all the toys there. They, they've done studies and they found that uh, most people think the toilet would be the dirtiest, but the toilet was the second dirtiest. The sink, actually kitchen sinks, were number one dirtiest places in the home. So always kind of be thinking what is most likely to be touched. Those are going to be high touch surfaces and that's what you need to disinfect, spend more time on, make sure the the wet time is going to be enough and make sure it's uh, they're wiped far more adequately than other surfaces even. Section four, personal protection equipment. So what is personal protective or protection equipment? It's called PPE for short. And PPE is all equipment which is intended to be worn or held by a person at work which protects them against one or more risks to their health or safety by providing a barrier against the skin, mucous membranes, and the respiratory tract. So PPE helps prevent the spread of pathogens. It should be durable, non-restrictive, and it should fit well. Some PPE is disposable and some isn't, so it's important to disinfect and maintain non-disposable PPE properly if you're going to be reusing it. Uh, one thing to keep in mind with PPE is in itself it might become a hazard because of the limitations it causes with vision, uh, walking, heat, and movement. That's why it's especially important to frequently train your technicians with their PPE on to make sure they get used to the limitations and how to properly deal with them. Some of those might be if you're it's if it's a really hot day and uh, you know they're in a, a hot area disinfecting and the the front glass on the uh, respirator or the the papper I'll explain what a papper is soon but you know if it gets if it starts to get wet it's going to lose its effectiveness so you're going to have to have you know spare N95 masks handy because uh, you, they're not going to work as well if they're uh, if, if they become wet from sweat. Uh, sometimes the full face respirators or the face shields, you know, if, if they're not or goggles or whatever you're wearing to protect you, sometimes they're going to limit your peripheral vision. So it's always very, very important that you get out there and you practice, practice, practice in whatever situation closely resembles your your work situation while your PPE is on so you can get used to it because you don't want to be on job and having put your PPE on you know see that that you're just overheating and you need to you know take many breaks and you want to make sure it's familiar territory and you're moving around in it and you're used to it. Uh, the other very important thing I want to show you is gloves okay as part of your personal protection equipment so why is black gloves and white gloves very important to have, okay? So you gotta remember that we're fighting an invisible enemy. And I know you guys have heard this on TV a lot, 
President Trump always talks about it, okay, we are fighting an invisible enemy, okay? So the invisible enemy is those micro germs, viruses that can be anywhere. So when we go into an area to disinfect, we have to have in the forefront of our mind, okay, we have to have the, the recognition that it's contaminated. There's a virus there, okay? And we have to protect ourselves, okay? Uh, so in order to do that, you need to start with two pairs of gloves, okay? A black and a white. And the reason why you wanna have a black and a white is because you're gonna be putting on a black pair first and then the white pair, okay? And the reason is that if I touch a sharp object, if I pull it, if I um, see that, if I see the black, okay, against my white gloves, guess what it means? It, it, it's ripped, which means that if it's ripped, I'm contaminating my skin, which then I can touch my eye or touch my nose by accidentally or whatever while I'm working. Next thing you know, I'm contaminating myself. So the minute you see the black, your white, it tells you that your white gloves have ripped. So throw them out in a special container that you're gonna have that's gonna be your waste to throw away your, your PPE, disposable PPEs to throw them away. Pauline here is gonna be wearing a uh, full respirator that actually has a little air canister, battery operated, charged overnight. It gives you full uh, eight hours of air that's forced into the mask to make it supposedly a little bit easier to breathe. And uh, Hannah here has another one that's uh, uh, just a traditional uh, mask and, and uh, with the cartridges, and that will protect you against uh, poisons. It will protect you against uh, the coronavirus and all that kind of stuff. So while they're doing that, I'm gonna be doing that as well. Hannah and I are gonna be showing you guys how to put on the PPE, the protective uh, equipment, personal protective equipment. Uh, the first thing you need to always put on is the gloves, and then Hannah's showing us how you put on the Tyvek suit. And after that, the last thing we put on is the, the headgear, the respirator, and then the booties go on last. Okay, so now we're gonna show you how to mix the, the disinfectant. So we need three and a half ounces. Section five, differences between cleaning, disinfecting, sanitizing, and sterilizing. So let's talk about the differences between all that. Let's talk about cleaning first. Cleaning reduces pathogens, dirt, and impurities from surfaces or objects by removing them. Usually it works by soap or detergent and water to physically remove the pathogens from the surfaces. This process does not necessarily kill the pathogens, but by removing them, it lowers their numbers and the risk of spreading infection. Cleaning is also a necessary first step towards disinfecting in most cases. Cleaning has been shown to reduce up to 98% of bacteria and 93% of viruses from surfaces in EPA tests. It also removes dusts, molds, irritants and allergens that can trigger asthma. Study guide question for cleaning. The most important thing to remember about cleaning is, does it reduce or kill pathogens? So it reduces them. 5.2, what is disinfecting? Disinfecting works by using chemicals to kill pathogens on surfaces or objects to a level of a six log kill. A six log kill or three log kill or five log kill or whatever we're talking about here, just so you can know, a six law kill is 99.9999%. So it goes out, it's a total of six spaces, but four decimal points to the right. Five law kill would be three decimal points to the right. Three law kill, one decimal point to the right. So just so you can know that that's how effectiveness is measured. Now, this process does not necessarily clean dirty surfaces or remove pathogens, but by killing pathogens on a surface after cleaning, it can further lower the risk of spreading infection. 
Disinfecting only works on hard, non-porous surfaces. Carpets and upholstery and other soft surfaces cannot be 100% disinfected with a chemical product alone. This is where devices come in handy. So here we are inside the kitchen of a restaurant, and what you have to remember is that when we disinfect a kitchen, for example, that has a lot of fruit prep areas, it has a lot of these utensils, that you know everything's going to need cleaning through the dishwasher before you they can actually reuse it. All these bins here, um, uh, we can do the the high contact areas you want to get. Okay, uh, inside here. We'll, we'll, we'll touch these because they're fryers. This area here does not need to be um, virus disinfected. Uh, we can sanitize these areas. These areas right here, high touch. You see the, um, the plates here? All these plates have to be cleaned or you can put plastic and cover them really well and then you can disinfect this uh, fruit, prep, food prep area. And then of course we need to rinse it down with a wet cloth, okay? Everything in the kitchen that can be used for food afterwards has to be cleaned and rinsed with potable water, okay, or through the dishwasher. So I just need you guys to remember that. Areas like this, for example, that have all the dishes and spice racks and things like that need to be either covered or, or uh, moved or cleaned afterwards and rinsed with water. So you want to get all high, uh, high touch uh, areas, uh, doors, these stoppers things, you want to, because people are always touching and pushing this door, front and back, and we're going to do the outside of the restaurant as well. So we're going to do the floors, let's keep moving, and then we're going to show you the customer area. We're going to show you the inside of the restaurant now as we walk in. This is your high touch area. We're going to disinfect this area right here. We're going to disinfect this uh, back side here. And everything that they touch a lot, okay, high, high touch area disinfect. We're going to disinfect tables. We're going to disinfect the chairs. And when you're touching the chair, you're going to disinfect all around the chair, okay, underneath the chair because when people sit, they always touch it here, here, and pull it. So we gotta do all these areas, this area right here. And then of course we wanna rinse it, remember, because people touch this and then they touch their food and then they touch their mouth. So anything that's gonna use a disinfectant, not a sanitizer. Sanitizer is fine, they can touch food, it's okay. Doesn't need rinsing, but when you're disinfecting, you wanna make sure that you're with a wet cloth wiping down after the dwell time, the contact wet time of 10 minutes you want to be able to set your buzzer down to 10 minutes wipe down. So we're going to do every one of these chairs. Here we are at the bar area, nice long bar inside the restaurant. And we're going to disinfect all these countertops, the chairs here. Now, if you notice, there's a lot of bottles, liquor and stuff behind here. So section six, tools and equipment. Let's take a look at the deep cleaning triangle. The deep cleaning triangle has three elements. The chemistry, which is obviously the chemicals and disinfectants you use. The operator, which is you, which the most important factor to know is that an operator needs to be properly trained. And number three, the tools and equipment, which really are the power. So it takes all three of these elements to be able to create a deep cleaning triangle. So tools make up one third of the deep cleaning triangle. Using the right tools makes faster and far more effective work compared to hands only cleaning. The second point of the triangle is the chemicals you're using, which we will discuss further in section seven. Considerations are that they are just the right concentration and the right types for the specific job. The third point of the triangle is the operator who follows training protocol that is described in section eight and make sure that everything is done right and according to the labels and using the right tools and the right concentrations of chemicals and the right application method for each job. All three of the elements of the deep cleaning triangle are required to have a complete and thorough deep cleaning. Study guide question for you to know for your test here is which element of the deep cleaning triangle requires proper training? And that obviously would be the operator.
So here we are setting the timer, dwell time of 10 minutes. The machine is already set at 0.1 gallons per minute to disinfect. And always start from one area of whatever area you're going to be disinfecting and slowly and thoroughly start disinfecting everything pretty much that is a high touch areas, the corners, chairs where people hold them. You want to get underneath the tables and systematically work your way down a room. Walls, floors, and remember when you're disinfecting that you should spray as though you're painting a car. If you've ever painted a car or used a spray, pan, a spray can, if you do it sporadically and not um, systematically, you're going to miss areas. So when you're disinfecting, you have to remember that you have an invisible enemy, the virus, and if you don't get an area, if you don't spray disinfectant in an area, guess what? It's not going to kill the virus. So you have to make sure that you get everything. 6.3 ATP devices. So let's talk about another commonly used tool. Uh, this is a tool that's different than the others because it's not used in the application of a chemical. It's really used to measure the cleanliness before and after you do a job. So ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. It's an organic molecule found in living cells. It is released by cells that are dead, dying, or under stress. When the ATP is expelled from a cell onto a surface, it can be viewed only by using a luminometer. A luminometer uses a naturally occurring enzyme, luciferous, which is found in fireflies to do this. The amount of light seen when the luminometer is pointed at a surface is directionally proportionate to the amount of ATP present in a sample. Its usefulness is only advantageous to see how well you've cleaned for documentation purposes. It does not tell you if you've killed the coronavirus because it doesn't have its own ATP to detect. Please keep that in mind with ATP devices. They are really only used when you start doing a larger jobs in school districts and universities and things like that. It really helps you with documenting a level of cleanliness. Viruses do not give off ATP, only living cells do. So it's not gonna tell you if there's viruses there, but, the, but it is proof that you've properly cleaned an area. So there are ATP testers that range from portable surface devices to large machines for the lab or shop floor. They work with a swab tester and use a sterile swab to take samples off a desktop or whatever it is. There are ATP testers being sold that work with snap type swabs that break to release the liquid testing fluids to wipe on the surface and then insert into the luminometer to get a numerical reading. Hi everybody. Today we are going to disinfect a warehouse and we're going to show you how to disinfect the warehouse. We're going to be using a little bit of different product uh, today uh, than we did last time at the restaurant. We're going to be using a product called uh, Procure. It's a little bit more expensive, but the great thing about the Procure is that it, it allows us to spray 10 minutes a surface and then you pretty much let it air dry. It doesn't need any wiping. It's food grade safe. You have food, if, it, if you're uh, disinfecting a food prep area and there's you know food counter, uh, make it touch food, it's absolutely safe. And uh, so we're gonna use that because we're gonna be disinfecting the warehouse. And uh, this particular warehouse, about 1,000, 1,200 square feet or so. The people in it uh, are working around the clock so we can't interrupt their business. So we need something that is a lot safer um, as, as they're going to be working um, in there. So we wanted to go in, go out very fast. Um, we got our timer here. And make sure that you use a timer and not uh, your, your phone or your iPhone to set that 10-minute dwell time. And the reason is that you don't want to reach in your pocket. Your gloves are contaminated. You're touching your phone, which then you're touching your face. So 
You want to keep phones and iPhones and that kind of timer away. Use your mechanical timer that you can wipe down afterwards and keep using it, of course. We got our respirator, okay, with, their, with your cartridges. Make sure you, when you get this, if you buy it from us, make sure you attach your cartridges. Otherwise, it's not going to work effectively. Okay, 7.1, EPA registered chemical list. What is the EPA? The EPA is the Environmental Protection Agency, which is the regulating body for disinfectants in the U.S. The EPA creates an emerging pathogen list N that is constantly being updated that is a list of approved chemicals to combat the coronavirus. The CDC does not have approval authority over disinfectants. They provide guidelines, but it's the EPA that is the regulatory body for disinfectants. Now, the EPA has a specific list of approved products to mitigate the coronavirus. Bleach can be used for virus disinfection, but cannot be used to spray on surfaces, obviously, because it is toxic and will destroy papers, fabrics, carpeting, wood, surfaces, etc. Therefore comes the need for professional chemicals that kill the virus, but will leave surfaces safe and intact and not destroy anything it touches. 7.2, dwell time. Dwell time, also known as wet contact time, or wet time is the amount of time to leave a product on a surface to kill pathogens. This is very important and you're gonna be reading and hearing a lot about this. You're gonna be reading it on the back of various chemicals and disinfectants. And you're gonna be hearing it from us a lot because it is of the utmost importance that you check the label for any chemical you're using to make sure that you are adhering to whatever wet time is recommended by the manufacturer. It's very important it stays wet. If you're just spraying on a disinfectant and then wiping it down like you would like Windex or something at home, that is not going to work for these types of pathogens. It is not going to work. It needs to stay wet for the recommended amount of time or it's not going to work. Here are some dwell times or wet times for some common disinfecting solutions for killing pathogens. For example, bleach has five minutes, Saniquat has 10 minutes, 70% ethanol is about 10 minutes, 100% uh, ethanol is five minutes, hand soap is about 20 seconds. Uh, most pathogen disinfectants are about 10 minutes. Hi everybody, Christos here from the MFS Training Center, Orlando, Florida. And right now we're gonna talk about tools, equipment, and chemicals, so please turn to the, I believe it's page 34, but it could be uh, 35 or 33 if we've added things. So turn to the tools, equipment, and chemicals page and let's go over everything. So as you know, I mean, your tools and your, your chemicals and your equipment is what's gonna make your business. So you need to have the best tools and equipment and chemicals if you wanna stay on top of the competition and be and offer a lot more than the competition. And that's what's going to differentiate you for, uh, from, from the other people that are uh, not offering all the products that you are offering. Hi everybody, we're here at the MFS Trade School and today I'm going to show you this great product. We got it from China. It is very durable, uh, very, very cool product. It's uh, uh, an electrostatic fogger or mister. So this part actually you can disconnect it right from here and not use this blower, okay? Which you can hear, see it has a big fan and it blows, uh, like almost like a big blow dryer. But you can take that out and also use this if you want to mist. But if you want to fog an area, you want to hook up the hose directly to this and then uh, pretty much you want to uh, touch the button right here, turn it on. Once I turn this on, I have water in here right now so I'm not uh, suited up with, uh, you know, the proper, uh, PPE and stuff, but uh, uh, just just water just to show you guys how it all looks. So after you turn it on, then you turn it on from here as well, and then that's how you're gonna get uh, nice fog. Okay, ready? One, two, three. You can see it up against the light if you point it, but literally I can spray a good eight feet. I can reach this wall literally from here I can reach a good uh, six to eight feet away. So I can, I can literally fog this whole room up, which is a good uh, 25 feet by 14 feet in probably maybe 15 seconds. So 
it is a pretty cool product, very durable, very versatile, and uh, we do uh, sell it here on our website at mfshoodschool.com and or mfstradeschool.com. Thank you so much. All right, check it out. Pretty light, holds up to 40 gallons, and it is battery operated, so you can charge it, and after you charge it, you let it go, and you can get a good eight hours of uh, run time uh, with this uh, battery operated uh, electrostatic fogger and mister. Thanks so much for watching. Hi everybody, MFS Trade School here, Orlando, Florida, and today I want to talk to you about a virus disinfectant called Analyte. It is EPA registered and on the end list of the EPA for killing the SARS-CoV-2 that, that causes the COVID-19. It not only kills that, but it kills a, a variety of uh, coronaviruses, influenza, HIV, many bacteria and spores. It's just an amazing product. And what makes it amazing is really that it's very organic. It is a salt brine solution passed through an electrolysis process that turns it into a very powerful oxidizing agent. So it mimics water. Pathogens thinks it's water, they go in it, and as soon as that water penetrates their cell membrane, the electrolysis and the salt kick in and burst the pathogen from the inside out. It's just an amazing, amazing, ingenious invention of a formula. Um, and not only because of that, but because it's organic, close to water, 6.5 pH. It's people friendly, it's pet friendly, it's plant safe, plant, uh, uh, safe, plant safe, okay? So you, in other words, when you're disinfecting an area, uh, you do not need to move plants out, okay? Uh, pets and people can literally be in one side of the room while you're disinfecting and then, you know, do the, do the whole area. Or you can have them step outside for five minutes and you're pretty much, five, 10 minutes, as soon as this thing evaporates, you're pretty much done. So for those reasons, we put it on, the, uh, on our holy grail list of uh, disinfectants because it's organic. It evaporates in 10 minutes. You do not need any wiping, unlike many other products that need wiping on food contact safe areas and, um, and uh, children's uh, toys and things like that does not need that. So uh, just uh, spray it on, mist it, spray it, wipe it, mop it. As long as it stays wet for 10 minutes, that's all you need. It will kill that virus and it's just an amazing, amazing product. In regards to storage, you want to store it in a uh, cool, dry place, okay? You do not want to leave this out in the sunlight because the sun will break it down to seawater, okay? It does have a shelf life of about a year, but you need to keep it in a cool, dry place, okay? This is an amazing product. You can find it on our website at www.mfstradeschool.com mfstradeschool.com. If you have any questions, feel free to call us. We have it in stock. You can get it in five gallons, 55 gallons, gallons, whatever you like. And um, we'd love to have you as our customer and as our student. We also offer training and certification for virus disinfection. You'll find everything on our website. Thank you for watching. Hi everybody, we're here at the MFS Trade School in Sanford, Orlando, Florida. And we train and certify for virus disinfection as well as commercial kitchen exhaust hood cleaning. And uh, we have students coming to us from all over the world. We have online classes. We've been training and certifying for the past seven years. And uh, it's our job to scout uh, not only the United States, but literally all over the world and find uh, great products, uh, great equipment, uh, and great chemicals, uh, uh, antimicrobials, disinfectants, and uh, that can really fight against coronavirus as well as many other pathogens and microbes that uh, uh, are getting everybody sick nowadays. So today I wanna tell you about a phenomenal product that is called the Surface Guard. And the Surface Guard gives you 90 days of Anti antimicrobial protection against all kinds of micro microbes and pathogens. It, uh, it is typically 
uh, sprayed on. It can be sprayed on. It's very versatile. It can be sprayed on. It can be um, um, applied with a with a cloth. It can be fogged, and uh, it's EPA registered. Uh, it's uh, not on the end list, uh, unfortunately, because it cannot go on the end list. It's actually a dry kill, so it doesn't kill like a regular disinfectant, but it kills like a product that uh, coats and creates a um, carbon uh, swords or spikes that actually is positively charged. So what happens is it attracts the virus, and then as soon as it sits on those spikes, it actually kills the uh, virus. And that way it's called a mechanical kill and, and therefore it's not a disinfectant. So when you use this product, you do have to use a uh, coronavirus uh, uh, disinfectant that is listed uh, with EPA on the N list, what they call the N list uh, for killing coronavirus. And, um, but, uh, it has all kinds, it's a, it's a 10 year old product. It's been invented, it has a patent um, and we resell it. We buy it by the pallets and we resell it to our students at a phenomenal price. So we get it straight from the source. And uh, we have reports here um, from um, comprehensive testing laboratories that show that it kills all kinds of microbes, viruses and everything. But unfortunately, like I said, again, it cannot uh, be uh, put on the end list of the um, of the EPA, even though it is EPA registered, of course. We have um, more laboratory tests. All these papers and PDF are PDFs on our uh, website next to the product, so you can see for yourself. We have a senior uh, a center uh, reference letter. We have a reference letter from another school. Uh, we have... Um, a reference letter from Crown Plaza Hotel in New York. This was dated back in 2010. So, um, you know, coronaviruses have uh, been around for a while. So here's another one from the Penn State University Wrestling Club. This, this product is a great product that you can put on mats. You can put it on soft and hard surfaces. So it acts as a two-step thing. So First, you gotta use an, uh, a coronavirus and listed um, disinfectant to kill the corona. And then 10 minutes later, as soon as it dries, you wanna use the surface guard to continue to give you protection against all kinds of bacteria and viruses and spores from MRSA to influenza to um, literally coronavirus is, is, is is not on here because it didn't exist back then when they did these tests, but um, it is a phenomenal product with great references and a great history. Like I said, it is EPA registered, it's water-based, uh, it's colorless and odorless. Uh, it protects against a, a wider range of um, uh, my microbes. It's highly durable, it's non-toxic technology. Once it dries, so you spray it 10 minutes, it dries. It doesn't come off with uh, you know, cleaning detergents or what have you. It will stay on a hard surface, a soft surface. It's biodegradable. It gives you long-term, up to 90 days of uh, microbial uh, protection. And it's literally a, a, a phenomenal product. Um, another one here uh, uh, from uh, another university. So we have them all here on our website. You can, you can pull them off. It's a phenomenal product, it is very affordable. My recommendation is that you use it in conjunction with uh, something like Vital Oxide, which again, you can fog, you can spray, you can do whatever, you can find that up on our website as well. But uh, we highly endorse this project. It has a great history as an antimicrobial coating. And uh, you can find it on our website at www.mfstradeschool.com. Again, www.mfstradeschool.com. You can call us direct at area code 407-732-4625. We thank you for watching. We welcome you to buy the product. Call us if you have any questions and uh, I'd love to have you as our customer. Thank you for watching. 7.3, how to safely mix chemicals. First and most importantly, you have to pay close attention to the hazard warnings and directions on the product labels. 
Cleaning products and disinfectants often call for the use of gloves or eye protection. For example, gloves should always be worn to protect your hands when working with disinfectant solutions. Before you mix any chemicals, make sure you're mixing in a properly ventilated room. It's important to make sure that your ventilation system is working properly in order to reduce the concentration of chemicals in indoor air from disinfectants. Ensure that staff who use cleaners and disinfectants read and understand all instruction labels and understand safe and appropriate use. If the wrong chemicals are mixed together, they can react to form a toxic gas. Chlorine bleach is an inexpensive, effective surface disinfectant at very low dilutions. For example, when bleach, which is sodium hypochlorite, is mixed with ammonia or quaternary ammonium compounds found in some disinfectants, chloramine gas is created, which is highly toxic and aggravates asthma. If a chemical is too concentrated, if you don't add enough water, indicated on the product label, then the health effects of using that product are increased, both for the people using that product and for the people occupying the indoor space where it's used. The important thing to remember about this part is what should you do when mixing chemicals? Make sure you're in a well-ventilated room, read and understand all instruction labels. So it would be C, all of the above. Those are the two most important takeaways from this section. Let's discuss pesticides because they're not really called pesticides. You don't hear that a lot in our industry, but really a pesticide by definition is any substance intended for preventing, destroying, or mitigating any pest. And although we think of them for getting rid of bugs, pathogens are also microscopic pests and the products used to kill them are considered pesticides also. So study guide question here, a virus disinfectant can be considered a pesticide, true or false? And of course it's true. Section 8, 8.1, the five steps of disinfection protocol. Step 1, initial site risk assessment. This is the initial part of the protocol. When you are called upon to clean, sanitize, or disinfect a space, you need to gather as much information as you can prior to going to the site as well as at the site before you start the work. Let's look at step 3, professional disinfection. This is the periodic or routine disinfection and maintenance of places without potentially infectious materials. So first you determine your safe and efficient process based on the initial risk assessment. Confirm that there are no cases of infectious disease in times of outbreaks. Is janitorial services required prior to disinfection? If so, will you be taking that on or subcontracting that out to a janitorial company? These are all the questions that you're gonna to need to be asking before undertaking a job. What about bathrooms and floors? Are you gonna be doing that or subbing that out as well? Will you be just spraying to keep the costs down or are they requiring wiping of all surfaces? All this is to be negotiated with the owner beforehand. Hi everyone, we're here at the MFS Training Center here in Orlando, Florida. And today we're going to talk about estimating virus disinfection. And I'd like everybody to turn to your training manual under or your PDF if you pulled it as a separate PDF and go to the estimating for virus disinfection section. Thank you. So when we're estimating a project during the initial site risk assessment period, that can happen with a phone call to a customer whether you initiated that phone call or they initiated that phone call or it can happen by going to the job site and actually meeting somebody and giving them an estimate. So during the initial site risk assessment period is when you're gonna find out what is required. What does the customer want? And sometimes the customer doesn't really know what they want. You have to actually um, educate them as to the proper way to disinfect because you may go to an area and you may see that there's a tremendous amount of grease, grime, and dirt uh, everywhere from if, whether it's a restaurant or if it's a home or if it's a business or a warehouse. And if it's not clean and there's dust and there's dirt and there's grease everywhere, you're not gonna get that five log kill. Even with an EPA registered disinfectant to kill the coronavirus, the, the, the pathogens just hide in the dirt and in the dust and then that 10 minute dwell time of that chemical or whatever the dwell time is, is not going to permeate the dirt and the grease and the grime to be able to properly kill those pathogens. So in such a case, you have to let the 
uh, owner know that uh, in order to, for us to do a proper disinfectant, you, we have to, or someone, either you can do it or we can do it, we can provide the cleaning, uh, and the, which is, falls under janitorial cleaning. And, and remember, janitorial cleaning and cleaning and, and sanitizing and disinfecting is completely different. So make sure you study that part in the uh, training manual where we talk about the difference. But you know your your cleaning is going to be your mopping using um, you know uh, surfactants and chemicals and soaps and detergents to be able to clean the dirt just like washing your hands you know so that's cleaning it's a lot more labor intensive it's a lot it's going to cost a lot more money obviously so uh, somebody's got to do that before you can properly disinfect so that's very very important to remember now what if a customer says to you well my place is clean and then you go there and you see that the place is not clean and you go like that on a counter and you see tremendous amount of dust or grease then you have to be able to tell the customer that sir or ma'am I'm sorry but this place needs a proper cleaning otherwise our disinfectants are not going to be as effective enough to give you that five log kill 99.999 percent killing all these pathogens so if they tell you, nah, I'm not going to pay extra to do this, uh, then what you need to tell them is that, well, then we have to put it on the job service report that I notified you and you sign off on it. That way, we're not responsible that we didn't tell you. Obviously, internally, what that does for you is it gives you protection. It gives you protection because now you've warned them, you educated them, and they decided they don't want to pay the extra money to do it right they signed off on it now you've pushed that liability to them okay and that's why the job service report which is one of your forms uh that you're that you that you're in your uh, lo student login area to be able to download we're going to talk about it a little bit later on and go over them that's the place where you would put that down okay 8.4 is step four, waste disposal, or also known as load reduction. So the standard procedure for handling waste vary depending on the situation. One should always wear gloves when handling waste. Place no-touch waste baskets where they are easy to use. Throw disposable items used to clean surfaces and items in the trash immediately after use. Avoid touching any used tissues and other waste when emptying waste baskets. Wash your hands with soap and water after emptying waste baskets and touching used tissues and similar waste. It's the health departments at the state levels that have different rules for disposing of contaminated waste. It's important to check with your county and state to see their standards for handling biohazard waste. Usually, if there is no confirmed evidence of a pathogen contamination, waste from a cleanup can be double bagged and disposed of in a dumpster and doesn't have to be treated like biohazard waste. In an incident-specific disinfection that involves potentially hazardous materials, the procedures in most markets will approximate the following steps. You can put waste in a red bag. They are usually marked biohazard waste, but don't have to be. If you produce over 25 pounds of biohazard waste each month, you will need to pay for a permit or license from the health department to handle the biohazard waste. They come and pick it up. And of course, you're going to also need a contract with a transfer company to come pick up the waste periodically, whether that's weekly or monthly or whatever you need it to be. So again, these permits, fees, and rules vary from state to state and even from county to county. So get a clear view of what the rules are in your jurisdiction based upon how much biohazard waste you're gonna be handling. So what agency sets the guidelines for biohazard waste removal? And again, it is the EPA. 8.5, let's look at step five, post-site assessment, the quality control step. First, you will conduct a post-visual inspection confirming that the spoke of the job was met and making sure everything is clean, disinfected, and you haven't left anything behind. 9.2, type two, incident-specific disinfection. The main difference between the two protocols is the incident-specific disinfection has an extra step of removing contaminants before the disinfection and before and after photos also becoming part of the documentation. This level of disinfection is used for incidents involving potentially infectious materials, also abbreviated OPM some of which are listed here. Accidents where blood is spilled or nosebleeds, body fluids such as what might result from fights, accidents, vomit, uh, feces such as in bathroom incidents, saliva, 
outbreaks of contagious disease such as virus outbreaks or pathogenic microorganisms. These incidents require more meticulous cleaning methods, also called forensic cleaning. And the last and final one is post-assessment. And here you have to take into consideration and be diligent with your visual inspection. You take digital after photos. If you've done a pre-bio test, then you complete a post-bio test, such as an ATP test, to measure the effectiveness of the cleaning process and to document it. You remove your PPE and you wash and sanitize hands. E, you have the client sign the job service report sheet signed by the owner. You give your certificate of disinfection sticker for the patron's window. You have the client sign the job service report, and then you document what was done for the file. Hi, we're here at the MFS Training Center, and right now we're gonna go over forms. So I'd like for everyone to turn to the page in their training manual or the PDF if you pulled it off a single PDF under forms and let's take a look at that. So you're going to see four forms in Microsoft Word in your student login area that you'll be able to download and actually drop in your logo, drop in your contact information, your, your address, your phone number, fax number, email, whatever you want, website and now you can make those your forms to be able to use when you prepare estimates and, um, and do business. So the first one, and we're just gonna name them really quick and then we're gonna kinda go into them to review them. If you have any questions on them, obviously, please feel free to, uh, to give me a call. Uh, the first one is the bid sheet. So the bid sheet is uh, more of a form that will give you all the all the things that we're going to be doing really okay it's like a line item sheet of the thing so that way we can get an idea in our head of what this estimate is really about all right and then we're going to take that bid sheet and we're going to transform everything into a nice order for to give to the customer and that is the form number two which is the estimate sheet okay so we take the bid sheet that actually we ascertain all the information and data and then we put it in the estimate sheet which is a little bit more um, uh, it's more of an organized order to give to a to a customer and um, and then we have um, the third sheet which is the the job service report sheet okay and the job service report sheet is uh, the form that really is the heart of all your forms and the most important one because it's there that you're going to put anything that you saw wrong that the customer maybe does not want to do. You want to push liability. You want the customer to sign that when you're all done that you completed the job to their satisfaction. Some people call this the satisfaction form. We call it a job service report because it is something that we also use for the uh, commercial kitchen exhaust hood cleaning and actually jurisdictions and fire marshals and health departments are used to requesting something that is called a job service report. So a lot of this stuff has not really been uh, processed yet by, by the health departments and, and jurisdictions of each uh, uh, state and city and county. But I assure you that in the years to come, these things are gonna become very, very important to protect the safety of all the people. So we don't want one business doing things wrong and next thing you know, um, you know, transmission of a virus you know, spreads in a community. So trust me, this is actually gonna be taken very, very seriously with um, local jurisdictions moving forward but they haven't yet come up with the protocols for everything and uh, we're going to be ahead of the curve by having the proper forms that uh, we're going to be introducing to them is going to make their life easier so the job service report is is something of great value and then of course the invoice when we're done we want to give them something that they've paid and uh, and a thank you so let's jump into these forms so 
first sheet, the first form, the bid sheet, okay? So on the big sheet, bid sheet, you have your name address, billing address, date, payment of terms, project description, payment terms. You better make it COD, um, cash, check, uh, credit card, but you know, don't wait for your money or you're gonna, they're gonna mail it or come back another day. Uh, because what's going to happen is you're going to be you're going to be playing collection agency and hunting your money down. So you want to get done, you're going to get paid. If they don't get if they, if if you know they don't pay you, obviously uh, there's a problem. Don't give them the um, the a virus disinfection sticker for their windows, uh, and of course uh, document it via email as well that uh, they owe you the money and they haven't paid for a service that you just finished. So, um, on that form, you have type of business, total square feet, all right? How many floors? How many rooms? How many computers? I mean, you may have something that's got 300 computers. It may take you three hours to wipe those down yeah, because you can't spray liquid to run into the keyboards and, and fry their computers. So, all these things matter. How many electrical rooms are there? Are there any electrical rooms? You got electrical rooms. Guess what? You better you better use a fogger, because if you use um, a sprayer, you're going to short circuit the the place, and it's going to it may cost hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage. So <clears throat> these this bit sheet is going to give you and paint a picture of what kind of chemicals you're going to need. You know, uh, what type of um, Machines are you going to use to deploy the, the disinfecting chemical? Are you going to use a fogger? Are you going to use a mister? Are you going to use a sprayer? Are you going to use wipes? You know, what are you going to use? All right, how many bathrooms? And of course, the bathrooms and the kitchens are the two places that we have to be very careful that there's no grease, grime, dirt on those because if there is, then the disinfected chemical is not going to really work to kill the coronavirus. So we have to add, you know, uh, a level three janitorial type of um, cleaning on that. Otherwise, we we got problems. All right, number of doors. How many doors you're gonna you're gonna be able to disinfect? Number of light switches. Number of handles or knobs. Square feet of vertical walls. Okay. Uh, inaccessible areas. Now, why is that important? Because if they're inaccessible and they're locked and you just gave them a report that you've disinfected the premise, then, you know, you have to write down. There was two rooms that were locked that we could not get in. Okay. That's very, very important. God forbid something happens later. Um, somebody gets sick or whatever. You have documented that room 342. We could not get in because it was locked. Okay, inaccessible areas. Um, is janitorial cleaning required and where may be required? Last disinfecting company. That's cool. If you can if you know who has done it last and we see that maybe they haven't done a great job, then that's that's something maybe uh, or a pattern may arise where you know this company's charging too much or too low or whatever. You know, it's good to know what your competition is. At MFS we are at the forefront of the virus disinfection industry. It is our mission to present and educate you on the most recent up-to-date products, chemicals, and procedures as the industry evolves and to use our purchasing power to secure discounted prices on chemicals and products. So always check our website for new chemicals and supplies, and we offer several other courses as well. We welcome you to visit our website at www.mfstradeschool.com or call us at 407-509-1449 for additional information. We thank you for taking the MFS virus disinfection course.